But I started hearing all these people going to these board meetings and talking about librarians and talking about how horrible we are. And when somebody would come back and say, librarians are professionals, they know what they were doing. Somebody even said, that makes them even more dangerous, the fact that they're professionals. And I'm like, what? I don't, I was a librarian for over 20 years, never had one single book challenge until this year. And this year there were hundreds. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of That Can't Be Right, a podcast about exploring structural wrongs, cultural oddities, and wild opinions. I am your host, Ryan Rogan. Before we get into the subject for today's episode, please follow along at TCBR Pod on Instagram, TikTok, and for this week, threads. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to last, but if you're enjoying this episode or any other episode, please rate, review, subscribe on your favorite podcast playing application. And for the good stuff. Today we're talking about books. If you're in the U.S., you've seen stories about book challenges, book bans, librarians and educators being fired, their lives being threatened, funding, autonomy being threatened, for having books on shelves that offend the sensibilities of what I think is probably a small but vocal and powerful and probably rich minority. And for many of us, Those are just headlines, but my guest today lived it and decided to walk away from the profession uh, rather than contend with accusations of indoctrination and grooming and whatever else people think. So, Andrea, welcome to That Can't Be Right. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And congratulations on retirement. I know the circumstances that led you there weren't fun, but I celebrate anyone who is out of the nine to five. (laughs) Thank you. Let's jump into it as... As someone who loves reading and did name that book, an accelerated reader and all those nerdy programs, uh, and whose mom (laughs) just dropped off a carload of books from my childhood bedroom, would let's learn more about you and your journey as a librarian. We can start with like the first book you ever loved and read over and over again. Oh my gosh. When I was a kid, uh, Encyclopedia Brown was the big one, and, and there were what, 50 different ones? And yeah. and I would read those over and over. Love it. Love it. As I got I older, a, I got into more realistic fiction kind of stuff. But I set a goal to read a book a month in 2023. Uh, jury's out on if I'll make that. But what are you what are you reading now? Oh, my gosh. Actually, right now I'm doing I'm getting ready to start traveling. So I'm reading a lot about how to handle and tow a fifth wheel trailer because when I retired I bought a fifth wheel and a truck and I have never towed one before so all of my reading right now is how to (laughs) oh there you go and valuable resource valuable resource and book probably better than the internet I my mom always asked if I know how to do something I was like I know how to google it but the paperback (laughs) hardback whatever is much easier to you know dog ear and whatever than, than your phone so love that when did you get your first library card? Do you remember? Was it a was it a momentous occasion for you? I remember going to the library when I was in elementary school and I didn't live in the city limits, so I couldn't get a library card to go to the city library. But then my grandmother lived in the city limits, so I used her address and got a card to be able to go to the public library and we would go every couple of weeks. It was it was a trek into town though. It was about 15 miles to get into town but it was it was fun I loved going to the library and hearing the story times and and then looking at all the different books because a school library has so many less books than a public library does in different sections and all that so Mm -hmm. no I totally understand I remember my first card and then I remember like just walking it up to the desk with a pile of books and they're like oh sweetheart you can only check out (laughs) him oh Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We'll just, we'll just, <laughs> and we'll come back for these next week. But in terms of your career, I know our mutual connection mentioned you were in the military uh, before you transitioned to the classroom. How did that happen? It, it, the whole reason I joined the military was um, my family was by no means wealthy, not even upper middle class. We were, we were in that lower middle class. We had what we needed, but there weren't a lot of scholarships at that time and I didn't want to put my family in debt or myself in debt to go to college. So I joined the military to get money for college. I knew 
probably from second grade that I was going to be a teacher. But then when I got older and started realizing the cost involved in that, it I just didn't want to be in debt. So I joined the military to get the money for college. And then when I got out, I got a job at the post office full time and um, went to school at night. So it took me a little while to get that degree. And I was actually a math teacher. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That's well, let me first go back. I didn't realize we had so much in common. I was in the National Guard uh, for six years. And my parents worked for the post office. My mom retired from the post office. My dad's still there. So, oh, wow. I'm also glad you got out. They have a lot of good stories and a lot of great coworkers, but also some pretty crazy stories and yes. <laughs> equally crazy coworkers. So, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That that is usually what I say. We'll do that episode after you've after you've made a few stops on your on your travels. So math math first, and then librarian. When when did you make that jump? It was so crazy. It was back when toss was still the thing, and I taught at a high school, and the librarian there said, "Hey, Miss Morris, you need to bring your kids in." And uh, let them use this new new computer system we have because this was a long time ago and computers weren't that big in schools. And she said, "I've got a I've got a program I want to try out to have the kids do a practice toss test." And I was like, "Okay, I'll bring them," you know. And while the kids were on the computers all day long, she was talking to me about what librarians do, and I was shocked. And um, it was really really cool the things that they do and the fact that she gets to work with every student on campus and every teacher on campus not just her department or her 150 kids that may be in her class by the time I left she had me talked into signing up for master's classes because you have to have a master's to become a librarian and um, she had me talked into signing up and uh, that spring I took my first classes and the next year I actually had a job as a librarian (laughs) That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I, you, you hit on some things like I didn't consider that would be such a plus for a librarian. Like you're working with everybody. You get a chance to interact with everyone, not just your class, not just your department or your teaching partner, depending on what kind, what kind of campus you're on. And I had this down to ask a little later in the conversation, but let's kind of get into it now. What are librarians doing? Because I think the misconception, especially in today's climate, is that you're just scanning books in and out. And, you know, I don't do that or didn't do that. I had student assistants who did that for me. First of all, to to even become a librarian, people don't know this. They think that it's just a job that you can get hired for with no qualifications. You have to teach First of all, I think now the requirement is you only have to have taught for two years, but you do have to teach and you have to have a master's in library science to be able to do that. And then what we do, I managed a $25,000 a year budget uh, buying books, supplies, not just supplies for the library, supplies that we would use, that students would use throughout the school Um cataloged. I had to read for every single book I bought. I had to read reviews on that book. If I hadn't read the book myself, I had to make sure that it was age appropriate. And then at the same time, with all of that, you have students coming in for help with computers because the librarian is also the technology person on campus. So I'm helping students with computers. I'm teaching classes. I taught research classes. Having trouble thinking of what else I taught at the moment, but it was a lot more than that. Very rarely did I ever check out books. If classes did come in to check out books, I was in the shelves with them, helping them find, especially those reluctant readers that didn't want to read. I was in the shelves helping them find something that maybe they could connect with, which would then make them want to read because you probably know. People think they don't like reading, but if you can find that one book that a kid actually likes, then they they'll like reading. For me, I I grew up watching. I'm the youngest of three. Sorry for the background, everybody, but I'm the youngest of three. So I saw my brothers reading. My dad read the paper, still reads a print paper from front to back every day. My mom reads, always has a book. And for my brother, who, you know, struggled like learning disabilities, things like that. 
for him, it was finding sports books. And as he grew up, it was John Grisham. It was Sue Grafton. It was like finding your genre, finding your niche is so important. But if you're a reluctant reader, you need someone like yourself to give you a push. So I'm glad, you know, students had access to that. And I'm glad we're reminding people because everything you mentioned, I remember having our librarian at my elementary school campus, at my middle school campus, high school campus, do all of those things. And I feel like it's so disingenuous when people are making the arguments or saying that librarians aren't necessary because this is all they do. No, you're instrumental to the experience of a student. So thank you for clearing that up. Another another thing that, that I did, one of the thing I guess was the most important to me was um, providing a safe place for those kids who didn't feel comfortable. Our school had over 2,000 kids. I think it was like 2,600 kids in it. And there is a group of students who are uncomfortable being in the cafeteria or in the commons. And um, the library was a safe place for them to come, whether they were coming to read or coming to play games. They had a safe place to be where they knew that there was an adult there who wouldn't let anything happen and who would give them a quiet place to be without without any fear. Also very important. And also missing for a lot of people outside of, not just in school, but there's a lot of talk about third places to go and just be able to sit quietly and especially go and maybe not have to spend money because adults have access technically to coffee shops. But if you're 14, 15, don't have a car, we're in Houston. It's not super walkable. That's yeah. a great place for people to go. We we mentioned libraries or you brought up libraries as a safe space. You're retired. So I hope you don't read the news all the time. I hope you have time to escape. But TA took over HISD. The new superintendent is getting rid of librarians on something like 30 campuses uh, for the coming school year. Have you seen that? And what was your reaction to that? To that I, news? I did not know that. I'm shocked. I'm so shocked because the librarian does so much in the school. I don't know what to say about that. It doesn't make a lot of sense for all the reasons you mentioned. Teachers are already whatever. I don't know what the standardized test is. I was a toss taker myself, but they're getting students ready for those for end of course exams, dealing with trying to continue to nurture students coming out of pandemic shutdowns. So it's it's really shocking. And I will, of course, link to news, news stories about it, op-eds from the Eastern Chronicle. One is, I think, pretty dumb. I don't have a better way to phrase it, but they're like, why is everybody so bent out of shape about shutting down libraries and schools? Hmm. I, I can't imagine why. <laughs> to pivot to kind of your your experience in the in the library on campus. And part of the reason I wanted to reach out is because the things that I mentioned at the top, book challenges, these accusations of indoctrination and grooming and whatever those words mean or whatever those people intend those words to mean. When did your spidey senses start tingling that this was going to be a problem or annoyance, a nuisance? You know, in the 2019-2020 year, we worked from home for that after spring break. And then the next year, some kids came back and some kids were working from home. And I started to see a little bit of people talking about the books in libraries. And then this school year, it just blew up. And even at the 21-22 year, in the spring semester, I started to see a very small loud group of the same three or four people go to all the board meetings and they would just get up and they only have two minutes but they would get up and for those two minutes they would talk about how librarians are indoctrinating kids and we're grooming kids and we're providing pornography. My, my thought on the whole pornography thing, pornography is intended the definition of pornography is material whether written or visual that's intended to elicit arousal. And one of the books that they really complained about was The Glass Castle. And The Glass Castle is a book, uh, a memoir written by a girl who was uh, sexually abused by her father. And they were calling that pornography. And I'm sorry, but if, if for that to qualify, it would have to elicit arousal. And if that book elicits arousal in someone, that's their issue. You know what I mean? 
But I started hearing all these people going to these board meetings and talking about librarians and talking about how horrible we are. And, and when, when somebody would come back and say librarians are professionals, they know what they were doing. Somebody even said that makes them even more dangerous, the fact that they're professionals. And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't get it. But it, I say it started in the spring of the 21, 22 years when I really started to see it. And this year, it just blew up. I, I was a librarian for over 20 years, never had one single book challenge until this year. And this year, there were hundreds. That was my next question. Like, how many had you encountered in your career up until, you know, this point? And it sounds, it went from zero to hundred real quick. Mm-hmm. Yep. The crazy thing about the specific book you mentioned, The Glass Castle, I was in high school, I think, when that book came out, and it was on our reading list. It was like recommended reading, summer reading, could get it at the library, was recommended by, by my teachers, by my librarian. And it's crazy that in just over a decade, people decided that it's not appropriate. And for the reason you mentioned, yeah, you have, there are issues if that's, if that's what you're taking away from that part of the story. Did you ever go to any of the board meetings in person? I went to one, <laughs> but I did, wa- <laughs> I did watch every single board work session and every single board meeting that I didn't attend in person. I watched them online and I kept intending to go speak at one because I wanted to, I wanted to kind of tell our side of the story, but I could never get it down to two minutes. So I just never, I never went and spoke. Do you want to do it right now? I, you know, if I were more prepared, I would, mm-hmm. but what, what I would really say is librarians become librarians because we care about kids, especially as I went along in my career, my main goal was to to take care of kids who feel different, kids who feel forgotten. They're challenging two areas, mostly. Uh, anything LGBTQ, and whether you agree or disagree, think it's right or wrong, there are kids that are members of the LGBTQ community. I wanted mm-hmm. to provide books that that those kids saw a character like them in. I'm not buying, I wasn't buying LGBTQ books that had sex in them. I was buying books that a kid could read this book and realize that just because they feel the way they do doesn't mean they're weird. The The highest um, percentage of students who commit suicide in high school are LGBTQ. And if they have something they can identify with, maybe they won't feel weird. Maybe they'll feel like they can identify with somebody and be who they are without being judged and I wanted them to have that I didn't have a huge collection but but I had some and those were mostly the ones that they were challenging and the other one that they were challenging was anything racial where a white person specifically a wealthy white person was not was the bad guy You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, All American Boys. That one is a hugely challenged book, and it's an amazing book. And it's not intended to make police look bad. It was intended to bring to light that, that what happened to this young man in this book really does happen. You know, and that's, Mm -hmm. and that's what books are. They, they, we want to identify with them and we want, if we can read about other people's experiences, maybe we can stop these kind of things from happening. Maybe, you know, learn about history and learn about what's happening and maybe we can do something about it. I, I had no idea about some of the experiences. I'm a white woman. I had no, I had no idea that black boys were talked to by their parents about how to react if they're stopped by a police officer until I started reading books like that, you know, no mm-hmm. idea. And, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to have books that, that all students could relate to, whether it was an immigrant from Mexico or India or, or a black kid or a Hispanic kid or, or a white gay kid or whatever. Anything that these people didn't agree with they're challenging 
under the guise of it being pornography or or um, bad language or um, sexual. The people, I don't have anything nice to say about the people challenging these books, so I won't. But I appreciate what you were trying to contribute to the campus. And I think it's dumb, for lack of a better word, that there are people who see these books as threats, who misunderstand them, who don't want to learn from other cultures and people who identify as other and instead fear them. And I hate that. And trying to do that, like your job, you didn't feel like your job was secure. You didn't feel like, you know, you were necessarily supported by by those people in charge. So I think a loss to, to your campus and to your district. And I hate that for your students and for all students who, who are losing that space and those resources. Can you share a little bit more about the process to get a book removed from the library? Like what did those challenges look like? Okay. When somebody wants to challenge a book, they are supposed to read the book in its entirety. I don't believe these people are doing that. Um, But they're supposed to read a book in its entirety. And then there's a form they fill out with the title, what they think is wrong with it, uh, page numbers where they see something wrong. Um, or inappropriate, where they found something inappropriate. They turn the form in to the principal of the school, and then the principal sends it to me. I convene a committee that has to have the principal, the librarian, uh, a parent from the community. Um, It can have a teacher. It can have students. But it has to have at least five people on the committee. Mm -hmm. And the two requirements are the the administrator and the uh, librarian. And then everybody on the committee reads the book and then we get together and we have a checklist of, uh, does this book, is it educationally significant? Does it provide something that's not provided in other books? Is it culturally sensitive? Is it, it's, it's a three page thing. So when I got a challenge, I would read the book if I hadn't already read it. And if I had read it, I would reread it. I usually made about a, seven, eight page document, I would go through and I would find Texas essential knowledge and skills that it would tie to. And believe it or not, it mostly tied to social study skills. Mm-hmm. Because, like, you know, I would I would find that I would find summaries, I would find any awards that it won, I would find reviews, good and bad, you know, because I wanted to see both sides of the story. We would do that. And then we would get together as a committee and discuss the book and make the determination whether it would stay on the shelf as is, uh, be moved to the district in their new policy came up with an adult collection. Anything that was written for ages 16 and above had to be moved to an adult collection. And students, for students to be able to check those out, even if the student was 18, 19 years old, they their parent would have to opt them in to be able to check out a book written for age 16 and up. So if we determined that it needed to be moved to the adult collection, then we would do that, or we could determine that it needed to be removed completely. Out of all of the challenges that I got, we moved one to an adult collection because there was some sexual descriptors in that we felt like the younger students, it was probably a little beyond what we were comfortable with. And the rest of them stayed as is. We didn't choose to remove any books from our collection. I had great support from my administration, even all the way up to the associate superintendent in the district and, and the lawyer, the district lawyer. She, she would make sure we understood that even though the Texas legislature was trying to come up with these laws saying that librarians can be arrested if they find something inappropriate on it or that they deem inappropriate on our shelves that, that we could go to jail. and But anyway, I kind of got off the subject there, but we, we didn't remove one single book from the shelf. And you mentioned it was only three to four people speaking at the board meetings. Is it, to your knowledge, is it the same people speaking at the board meetings submitting these requests, the, the flood of requests? One community member who doesn't have any students at any of the high schools did all of the challenges at all of the high schools. One person. Uh, I did get one challenge from from a different person. 
So I, sh I shouldn't say one did all of them, but this one person did over 300 challenges. I don't know if there's anything I've done 300 times. That's crazy. I'm sorry. I'm at a loss for words. 300 challenges. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then every time, so it was at all the different high schools and every time the committee would, would determine that the book is appropriate and would leave it on the shelf, this person would blow up social media with, with how horrible we are for continuing to allow librarians to indoctrinate these kids. I don't, I don't understand what I'm trying to indoctrinate them to though. That's what, that's what got me. Mm -hmm. um, Out of Dust was one of the books that was challenged and it was a historical fiction book about, it took place in, in 1923. You probably have heard the story of the church that got blown up in East Texas and there was a young black man and a young girl from, or teenage girl from Mexico who ended up falling in love. In the end, this church gets blown up by a white person, I might add, but the, the black boy got lynched and hung for it. And they ended up lynching and hanging the Mexican girl too, just because of all the prejudice in that community. And, when I got that challenge, I was like, how are you, ch what are you challenging this on? Mm -hmm. And they challenged it based on when the girl from Mexico went to school. It was an all white school. When she went to school, some of the boys said, oh, I sure would like to put it in her cornhole. And back in the 1920s, cornhole referred to anal sex. But nothing ever happened. That was the only mention through the whole book of it. And they wanted that very valuable book to be removed because of that one word because that, that one sentence great book by the way i i'm <laughs> i'm writing all of these books down uh to add to my list like reread the glass castle out of dust all american boys like i i got them i got them that's so crazy and you mentioned you know that can't be right that's what this podcast is all about you mentioned you weren't confident that the person submitting these challenge, the people submitting these challenges were reading these books and then it's one person and then it's 300. So there's, there's not no chance, but there, the chance is very small that this person was reading all the books. You might not know the answer, but are these people just like trolling online forums and communities to like find these books to challenge it, find these books to challenge? There is a website that you can go to that has a playbook that these women have created that tells you what books to challenge, what pages to find the information to use in your challenge, and what to put for why you're challenging. And it has it has hundreds of books. So it's on like that, on this website. It's Cliff Notes for Evil. Exactly. I mean I guess there's a business for everybody. Throughout this process, uh you mentioned you had support from your administration, the legal support up to the associate superintendent. Throughout this process, did the people, sub the person submitting these challenges ever indicate any interest or openness to hearing about the selection process for books? Because you mentioned you're reading them, you're reading reviews, you're vetting them already. The district has so many high school where other librarians are doing the same. Did they ever even entertain the idea that this work has already been done. No. <laughs> the person had no interest in knowing what the process was because they felt like the process didn't matter because we were still selecting books that they deemed inappropriate. Hmm. I would have loved, you know, actually asking about that though, um, I did get several phone calls when the district enacted the policy January 13th of 23 of this year, the new policy went into effect about parents having to opt their students in if they wanted to check out adult books. I talked to a lot of students about it and I didn't try to tell them opt in. I said, I want you to talk to your parents, have a discussion an, an educated discussion about this. So I told them all about the process and all about what it meant, what adult meant and asked them to go home and have a conversation with their parents. And then they decide whether they should opt in to check out the adult books or not. And I got many phone calls. I was on the phone a lot for the next month or so, and not one single person 
every person I talked to was like, that is just stupid or that's crazy. Or of course I'll opt my son in to be able to check out the the glass castle or or those adult books. Mm -hmm. Um, When it first came out, I think some of the parents thought that adult meant adult. One person went to a board meeting and said that we were subscribing to Hustler magazine. I mean, (laughs) what a leap. They they just made stuff up, you know? Oh, sorry about that. But um, uh, everybody I talked to was happy to then go in and opt their student in to be able to check out this adult collection of books. Once I reassured them that, that it was nothing pornographic, that it was just any book that was written for ages 16 and above. And in adult content, almost every memoir is written for ages 16 and up simply because the, the target audience is ages 16 and up. Uh, memoirs, you write a memoir as an adult, so you're writing for other adults, it doesn't mean it has any kind of sexual content or bad language. I could, I could probably, I bet I had 500 books that ended up in the adult collection that had no foul language, no sexual content, nothing like that. But because on the reviews it said written for ages 16 and up, I was forced to put it into the adult collection. I'm glad the books are still in the library. I hate it that they added that step for you, for parents, for students to access books. But you brought up a really good point that I had not considered throughout our conversation, like your interactions with students. How did those change as the challenges rolled in? You mentioned kind of articulating the idea behind the adult section and the opt-in process, but... How else did did your interactions and relationships with students change as these books, you know, as you were dealing with everything else? When the new policy went into effect, the hardest thing for me was when a student would bring up a book and I would have to tell them they couldn't check it out. And I would tell them why and we would have a discussion. And then usually within a few days, that student would come back and grab the book and their parent will have opted them in. But I I had a lot more conversations with students about what's going on politically. And I I had to try really hard to keep my politics out of it because a librarian's job is not to let anybody know our views. You know what I mean? And not to censor. Like if I'm against something, I can't not buy a book because I disagree with it. And if I'm for something, I can't buy a hundred books and, and tell kids, hey, check out this book. That was another thing that changed for me as, as all these policies started changing and the legislature started doing what they were doing and the challenges rolled in. If the kid would come in and say, hey, Miss Morris, what book do you recommend this week? I was scared to recommend a book. I, I would go, if it was a student I knew, I would take them to a certain section and say, well, I like this author or or I like this genre or whatever. But if it was a student I didn't know, my first question would be, well, what, what are you interested in? What, what kind of book do you like? And, and then if they liked fantasy, I would take them, my, my library was genre-fied. So I would take them to the fantasy section. I stopped recommending book titles just because I was afraid that then somebody would come back and say, well, this librarian told this kid to read this, even though it was just a suggestion that I was asked for. I actually got closer to many students through the process because they were hurt. They felt, I I went in and talked to every government class and sociology. That was, that was fun. I got to go in and talk to them. And, And then the government teacher would chime in about how these people are trying to infringe on their First Amendment rights. And uh, they said, even if you don't read a book from the library, think about the fact that your rights are being infringed on with this. So I actually got closer to a lot of students through it because then students who had never even been to the library would come to the library and talk to me about how their rights are being infringed upon and what they can do to change that. And that made me feel really good about about our young people, how they really cared about getting involved, even if they're not readers. That's good. I think for I, like, I'm imagining how I would have reacted 
if this had happened when I was on campus. And I'm not sure, but I'm excited that the students saw what was happening and were reacting to it and, you know, trying to protect their rights and the rights of, you know, their peers and teachers and things like that. So that's that's probably the best news, best part of this conversation so far. People with the most sense, maybe. When did you see the writing on the wall for yourself? What was the maybe the straw that broke the camel's back and kind of helped you make a decision about your future? I loved my job. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I told you, I wanted to be a teacher since probably second grade, maybe even kindergarten. I loved my kindergarten teacher, but this past year, I caught myself not wanting to get out of bed and go to work. And I've seen people who worked too long and ended up being unkind. And I never wanted to get to the point where I was unkind, especially to students. I felt myself dreading going to work and being shorter with students sometimes. And I just couldn't imagine getting to the point where when I did retire, somebody said that I was mean or unkind or it wasn't about the challenges as much as it was about how I was reacting. And in my whole life, I've been, I've loved my job. I've been a happy person. I've, I've had so much joy in my life and, and these people took the joy out of my life, not just my job. Mm -hmm. I even started therapy and my therapist would tell me, you know, you can quit. And I was like, no, I cannot. <laughs> you know, I, I can't quit because um, I can't afford to quit, you know, and I've been in education too long. And, and after a while, I just realized that to save my own sanity and, and get some joy back in my life, that I had no choice but to retire. I was scared. I was sad. I was mad. And it was showing. And I can't be that person. No, I totally understand. And I'm glad you took the steps necessary for your well-being to find that joy. Uh, It is no fun to wake up in the morning and not want to do your job or, you know, worry that the next interaction is going to make you snap or whatever. So I, I hate that that's how you were feeling at the end, but I'm glad you found a path pathway out um and like we mentioned earlier like you're you're headed on the road so that's that's amazing we mentioned if you were going to a board meeting what you would say is there anything you would want to say directly to the people challenging these books or to people who are thinking about challenging books or people who think that challenging books or limiting students access to libraries doesn't matter i would say please talk to your kids talk to librarians, talk to educators and find out what we really do and what we really believe and what we really stand for before you decide that we're this bad, evil person that wants to indoctrinate. It's not the word I'm trying to think of. Before you decide we're this bad person that doesn't have your student's best interest at heart, get to know me. I would have loved if the person doing all those challenges would have called me. I would have met her for a cup of coffee and, and had a conversation and I would have listened. You know, I'm, I'm an open-minded person. I would have listened to the concerns and who knows, maybe she, maybe we could have found some common ground. Maybe I could have understand stood that side a little bit. More, I would have never gotten to the point where I would have censored books, but at least maybe we could have gotten to know each other. I guess my main thing is just talk to people about what they do before you decide what they do on your own. Mm -hmm. What they do and that you can do it better, you know better than them, which is what seems what a lot of this boils down to. Andrea, I don't, I don't have any other questions yet. Is there anything we didn't discuss? that you would want to share? I think the main thing that that I want people to know about libraries is that it's they are more, especially school libraries, they are more than a place for students to check out books because a teacher tells them they have to read. Mm-hmm. You know, um, 
libraries are safe havens for kids. My library was not a quiet library. <laughs> um, they would come in. I had I had games. I had puzzles. I had I had quiet corners. I had exercise bikes, and kids would just come in. They would come in in the morning and at lunch and after school, and sometimes even stop in between classes just for a quick word of encouragement. And libraries are so much to these students. And the idea of libraries closing and losing that professional librarian who is so much more than just the person that picks out books, that makes me really sad. And, and part of me is angry at myself for retiring because I was that advocate. But in the end, you, you have to you have to take care of yourself. And, and I had to do that. And I'm seeing more and more educators, not just librarians, leaving before they were ready. I was going to work nine more years mm -hmm. and at, at least nine more years. And um, I just I just wish that. Do you remember probably even 10 years ago when you were in school, you remember thinking teachers were you saw them as this professional and you respected them, all, all educators. Mm -hmm. You know, I, a librarian's a teacher. So when I say teacher, I'm talking about teachers and librarians. Mm -hmm. You saw them as a professional. You, you admired them. You respected them. And I'm seeing that go away more and more and more. And, and they're seeing us as, I don't know why they think we got into education because you know it wasn't for the money. Right. Why else would we get into education except for the fact that we care about kids and we have kids' best interests at heart? And why would I become a librarian if I didn't care about those kids? Right. You know, and, and I wish people would take time to learn that and not judge. I mean, I'm not going to go to school for four years and get a bachelor's and then go to school for two more years to get a master's so that I can then go in and try to hurt kids. Yeah. You know? I think you, you hit a, a really important point about the societal value we place on educators. I think you mentioned it too. The pay has never been great. The pay has never been great. But it was a profession that people respected, and you respected what teachers told you. Uh, you respected the feedback or parents respected the feedback that they got from teachers about kids. Kids listen to their teachers. The headlines coming out of schools about what students are saying, doing, how they're treating teachers is unfathomable to me. But I think between the pandemic and politics and whatever, it's changed tremendously. And people feel very, very comfortable calling their credentials, their abilities, their passions, their desire to want to help students in a question. And it's, we're having this conversation today because of how it impacted you. And you see it with your, with your colleagues. I see it with my friends who have decided to leave the classroom too, and it stinks. And I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but, um, I hope by giving you a voice here, we can do what you know, what you weren't able to do in the board meetings, not out of a lack of ability, just that, that two minute limit to, to share this story and for people to get a better understanding of what's, what's going on on campuses and how the educators feel about it, how the students feel about it, how the parents feel about it. So well, I appreciate people like you who want to bring it to light, who want to hear the other side and, and what we're really about. So thank you. Yeah, I, I'm trying. You, you, like I, like I said at the beginning, you read the headlines and it's, we don't always think about the the human impact of the stories we're reading necessarily. So whatever we can do to share and to to remind people how I like again, I'm a nerd. I had fun in the library as a kid. <laughs> so I still love going to the, the library. I have one, I have a county card, I have a city card, I have one for other cities I've lived in. I remember my librarians and the books they recommended to me and they were, you know, an important part of my my educational experience. So Andrea, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish you the best. If you find your, I hope maybe you'll find your way back to a classroom. Maybe the, the ties will change. I don't know, but I, I really appreciate your time. I'm sure the students appreciated you and safe travels. Thank you so much.
Well, thank you. And and just because I retired doesn't mean I'm not going to be an advocate. I'll still be an advocate. I just won't be the person under all the pressure. Right. You're not doing the paperwork. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best part. Because, I mean, you mentioned that. How it's. Uh, I could go on a rant, but we'll end it. We'll end it here. But it's it is wild that 300 books you're reading them, the whole committee's reading them, everybody's chiming in. What a ugh, what a waste of resources, but Andrea. Thank you so much, everybody else. <laughs> thank you for listening. Uh, if you don't have a library card for your county, your city, whatever community, your township, I don't know, province, go get one. If you see people challenging teachers, educators, administrators, whatever. Throw your support behind, pay attention to what's going on in the news, and uh, come back for more of That Can't Be Right wherever you get your podcasts.